Brazil is fighting to control a devastating COVID-19 outbreak while it tries to save its economy. We talk with the Brazilian ambassador to the United States and later a group of analysts on what we can expect for the country in 2021. Hello, I'm Arnold Naidu and this is The Heat. Brazil, the largest country in Latin America, has been hit hard by the coronavirus pandemic. The country recently overtook the United States in the number of daily cases and deaths, with over 2,000 people dying in just one day. President Jair Bolsonaro has been criticized for what many see as his incompetent response to the pandemic. For more, let's go now to Sao Paulo to talk with CGTN correspondent Paulo Cabral. Uh, Paulo, great to see you. The Brazilian government uh, has just announced another change in the country's health minister. It will be the fourth since the start of this pandemic. What's going on? Well, that's right. It's the cardiologist Marcelo Queiroga now replacing Army General Pazuello, who stayed in the position for 10 months. It was an average of nine months each minister during the pandemic here in Brazil. And most analysts are already saying that they did not expect much change in the government policies with Marcelo Queiroga. Actually, the new minister himself said today to journalists that the policies are of the government and not of the Minister of Health. So he's been criticized also for being very close uh, to the Bolsonaro family. Uh, analysts say that it was an indication, actually, of uh, uh, Bolsonaro and his family. Uh, and actually, before Marcelo Queiroga, Bolsonaro talked to another doctor, Ludmila Hajar, uh, who was uh, considered to be almost uh, accepting the position. But then she left the meeting with Bolsonaro, saying that they had technical uh, uh, disagreements that did not allow her to take this position. And Marcelo Queiroga uh, seems to be, say, analysts, more uh, uh, amenable to uh, the, the position of Bolsonaro, who is against social distancing and has uh, just more recently actually started to encourage people uh, for vaccination. He, uh, in past weeks, was opposing vaccination. Now he's changing a little bit his attitude, and uh, this has a lot to do with politics, actually. Also, most analysts say with the coming of uh, former President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, his comeback uh, to, to Brazilian politics. So Marcelo Queiroga will actually take over the Ministry of Health in the worst moment of the pandemic here in Brazil. Actually, we had today broken another record in the number of deaths, 2,841, so Brazil nearing 3,000 deaths uh, because of COVID-19 in one day, and uh, at the same time trying to, to, to roll out vaccination in the country. So far, only about 5% of the population got one dose, and again, the federal government is criticized for not having uh, close deals earlier with the big laboratories around the world to have access to this uh, vaccine. So still, the pandemic uh, going strong here in Brazil and not really a sign that this will change in the next few days or weeks. Uh, Paulo, uh, Sao Paulo State uh, imposed this week very restrictive measures to try to stop the virus. You, of course, is right now in the city of Sao Paulo. Uh, what can you tell us about these restrictions? Well, look, they are being enforced, actually. It's now what they call the emergency phase of the pandemic, so only essential services can operate. There is also a curfew here in Sao Paulo from uh, 10 in the night until 5 a.m. We have seen uh, quite a few uh, police operations actually stopping parties, sometimes with hundreds of people that were happening here in Sao Paulo. So authorities are trying to enforce uh, these restrictions here in, in the state of Sao Paulo and in the city of Sao Paulo, but not always with the collaboration of the population. It's not only in Sao Paulo, also the state of Minas Gerais, also one of Brazil's uh, biggest states, has imposed more restrictions, and other areas of the country as well. It's a, a big concern with the number of deaths and also with the collapse of the health system. Uh, in many areas already, there are uh, there is a lack of, of, of intensive care uh, beds. And, you know, here in Sao Paulo, for example, one example is that uh, private hospitals have now been requesting the public health system for beds because they are collapsing. Until now, we've seen the collapse of uh, the public health system, which is universal uh, and, and, and free for all, all over the country, but usually uh, very constrained. And now we see also private hospitals saying that they are just reaching their limit. 
Thanks, Paolo. Stay with us. Uh, we will have a panel to discuss the latest in Brazil. But first, our interview with the Brazilian ambassador to the United States, Nestor Forster. I spoke with him earlier and started by asking for his assessment of the situation in the country. There are many challenges going on, and uh, the government is doing everything it can to face uh, the situation. Uh, you know, we have uh, already vaccinated almost 11 million Brazilians. We have millions more of, uh, of uh, vaccines available to state governments and municipalities who are at the forefront uh, of this fight. The federal government has also uh, transferred resources uh, to the most vulnerable uh, of Brazilians to the tune of 8% of our GDP. It's an unprecedented, and I don't think there's any other country uh, which has done so much as Brazil to, to help people uh, fight the scourge uh, of the pandemic. Uh, you know, uh, even though the numbers are, are uh, really, really sad at this point, uh, just to put things into perspective, in terms of uh, deaths per million inhabitants, Brazil uh, occupies not the first, but the 24th position right now. Uh, you know, we will continue to fight this at all levels. And uh, just yesterday, President Bolsonaro signed a new bill uh, into law allowing for the states and municipalities to acquire vaccines as well as the private sector uh, in order to help the effort of the federal government. So this should start to produce results, we hope, uh, in the short term. Now, Brazil is a vast country. We see it stretching from the Atlantic all the way into the interior of uh, South America. There's some very remote parts of the country. I'm thinking about a city like Manaus, for instance. What can you tell us about the situation deep in the Amazon? Well, Manaus has been one of the hardest uh, hit uh, places. It's, as you say, it's right at the heart uh, of, uh, of the Amazon uh, rainforest. And uh, I mean, there are some challenges on the ground there. As I said, you know, uh, the federal government is doing its part, the Ministry of Health, transferring resources so that people on the ground, healthcare workers and uh, hospitals and, uh, you know, uh, local authorities can do uh, what they can to, to help people. And uh, there's also one, one thing that's, that's it's good to report in, in a very dire situation, which is the fact that uh, all of the indigenous peoples uh, in Brazil have already been vaccinated. Uh, what is the vaccine strategy for the country? You know, as I said, it's a vast country. You've got to get these vaccines to very remote parts of the country. Um, what kind of rollout is the government planning? Well, the rollout, uh, I mean, uh, on, on one side, the question of acquiring vaccines uh, we have uh, 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 already commitments for, for uh, over 270 million doses of vaccines uh, uh, during this year from different sources. And, uh, you know, that should be more than enough to, to, to meet uh, our needs. There's also efforts at the local development of vaccines in Brazil, which are, are being, uh, you know, manufactured from uh, uh, imported uh, inputs, some of them, and others are being developed in the country, which uh, should, uh, should give us uh, uh, an additional strength. Now, Brazil has a public health system, which is, uh, has lots of experience in applying vaccines in a massive scale. We've done very uh, many successful vaccination campaigns uh, in the past, and that should be an asset in fighting uh, the, the COVID pandemic uh, this time as well. Um, you know, if you look at a situation in the country right now with vac people already being vaccinated, um, what kind of timeline are you looking at? How many people do you expect to have vaccina vaccinated in the months ahead? Uh, well, you know, right now Brazil occupies, you know, uh, in absolute terms, uh, we have uh, the fifth largest population of people already vaccinated. Uh, there are different targets for that. That's handled by the Ministry of Health. I don't want to get too much into detail. You know, I'm not an expert in this area, but uh, the expectation is, is that, you know, m most Brazilians, especially those most vulnerable, healthcare workers, uh, uh, elderly. Uh, right now, people above the age of 85 have all been vaccinated throughout the country. And as you said, with the many challenges that such a, you know, a vast and diverse country such as Brazil poses to this sort of, of rollout. And uh, we should continue to see steady progress in, in the, the weeks and months ahead. We've seen that in many countries, this pandemic has become politicized and Brazil is no exception. We've seen it being politicized there. In fact, the former president of the country, uh, Lula da Silva, recently called President Bolsonaro's policies moronic. Do you think that the pandemic and the government's response to it is having a political impact on the country? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, there's political exploitation these days of, of, uh, of the pandemic and of so much else. 
We don't think we, that's a, a very uh, wise way to fight a pandemic. Uh, it should be thought, you know, in the health domain, in the scientific domain, and uh, you know, the public health system should should uh, respond. Uh, I don't I don't see that we gain much by politicizing this or trying to to, to pinpoint or or scapegoat that this uh, tremendous tremendous challenge that you know all nations around the globe are facing on on uh, one leadership or the other. We don't think that's very ingenious. The pandemic has also uh, had an impact on the country's economy. Uh, it's had an effect on economies around the world. The Brazilian economy contracted by 4% last year. But relatively speaking, if we look at the region, it wasn't as bad as Argentina, where the economy there plunged by 10%, or in Mexico, where the Mexican economy plunged by 8.5%. Now, of course, to achieve growth, the country needs to open up. But at the same time, to combat the pandemic, you need to maintain some kind of a lockdown. So how difficult? Is this kind of balancing act for the country? It is a balancing act. You're right, Anand. Uh, President Bolsonaro, from the outset of the pandemic, he, he took a, a, a huge stance of, you know, not having a one-size-fits-all solution, considering the diversity of the Brazilian regions. But, uh, you know, above all, considering those most vulnerable, those Brazilians who have to wake up in the morning and go win their bread for their families, and, uh, you know, who, for, for whom uh, the lockdown would not be, uh, you know, a workable proposition. So, you know, as you said, it's, it's uh, in a way, it's a balancing act. And uh, in the case of Brazil, it's been very much up to the local local instances, local authorities, uh, both at the municipal and at the state government level, to establish exactly, you know, uh, what sort of restrictions they deem necessary according to the profile uh, of the different regions in the country. Now, turning to Brazil's relationship with the United States, uh, President Bolsonaro had a very cordial relationship with the former president here, President Donald Trump. In fact, in many respects, they were ideological bedfellows. But now, of course, there's the new president in the United States, Joe Biden. Do you expect relations to change significantly? Look, uh, you know, uh, international relations, relations among countries are not made of ideologies. They are made of shared interests and shared values. And that applies perhaps most more than uh, to, to any other situation to, to Brazil and U.S. relations, considering that we have, you know, almost two centuries of very, very close uh, relations. It's, it's, a, it's a longevity that Brazil enjoys with no other country. And that's based on the shared values of democracy, of democratic values, the respect for the rule of law, for human rights, for economic freedom. So that's, that's let's say, that's the bedrock upon which our relations uh, take place. And that, of course, goes beyond this or that administration. And we are seeing that uh, uh, proving right uh, with the new administration with whom we are already engaged in several fronts on a very productive relationship. If you listen to uh, what has been said by you know, spokesperson uh, at, at the White House and at the State Department and in recent interviews, they all stressed this strategic character of our partnership, the shared values and the commitment of the Biden administration to continue to work uh, with Brazil uh, towards, you know, this uh, very, very broad agenda that uh, both our countries share as the two largest democracies, the two largest uh, economies in the Western Hemisphere. How would you characterize the U.S. relationship uh, or policy in Latin America right now? You know, we know that President Biden, in fact, he said this, he'd like to be more engaged with the region. Uh, there's a shift of focus away from the Middle East, for instance, towards this hemisphere, towards the Western Hemisphere. Uh, do you see the United States getting more involved? We certainly hope so. You know, uh, it's not up to me to comment on the, on the policy from the United States, but seeing from the Brazilian perspective, uh, we welcome uh, more engagement. Uh, you know, it's a tendency of every government to, to concentrate on the, the biggest challenge, the hard spots. You know, we have the whole question of uh, the, the Venezuelan dictatorship being an, a factor of instability in the region. And uh, we see a, a renewed commitment by the Biden administration to address that situation. And of course, Brazil has been at the forefront of supporting democratic transition uh, in Venezuela. Just yesterday, we had a polling news of uh, a denunciation coming, a statement made uh, uh, from the, the United Nations Commission on Human Rights about 200 murders uh, attributed to the, the Maduro's police in Venezuela in violation of very, you know, the right to life of Venezuelans. And uh, that it's an appalling situation that needs to be addressed. But we, we hope that the administration also will continue to work with us looking beyond that looking uh, on the whole question of, you know, how we can get closer economically, how we can keep the traditional ties we have, for instance, uh, in investment. Uh, we also, you know, in the case of Brazil, we have a very busy agenda 
in a, in a whole uh, area of uh, scientific cooperation, space, space exploration, there is a, a tremendous activity and historically so uh, in the whole realm of defense and military cooperation between our countries. So we see that this agenda will be moving forward and we very much welcome uh, this renewed engagement by the U.S. Ambassador, thanks for joining us. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much. OK, let's bring in our panelists now from Rio de Janeiro via Skype. Paula Hedges is a resident doctor on infectious diseases at Fiocruz, a leading research institute in Latin America. From Sao Paulo, also via Skype, Gustavo Ribeiro is a journalist and founder of the Brazilian Report and still with us, CGTN's Paulo Cabral. Great to have all of you with us for this part of the program. Paulo Hedges, let me start with you. Um, Brazil is approaching 300,000 deaths right now. And we heard that very grim figure from Paulo Cabral earlier on telling us that in just one day there have been 28, more than 2,800 people who have died. We know that the number of cases is also spiking and hospitals are running at maximum capacity. What is your reading of the situation in the country now? Yeah, thank you. Um, so, unfortunately, the records that we are saying are all in the worst possible way. And I will take a time just to disagree with what was exposed by the ambassador. Brazil is not doing its best. It's not doing its best when we are almost reaching the 300,000 deaths. And we cannot agree that saying that we are the fifth country in total number of getting vaccinated people because we are not. We are behind the world because we committed the mistake at the beginning and we keep committing this mistake. We were not prepared. We, um, and when I mean we, I say in the middle of the, this whole government and what we are saying and living, it's quite hard for someone who is truly working on the front side. Um, we see all the people and all the doctors, nurses, and everyone that works inside the hospital, how this has been disgusting. And when we go back home and we see on televisions even worse numbers and not seeing the whole uh, support that we expected from the government, so definitely it's not doing the best. Um, another point that is quite sad is when we say about this whole police that we have and these kind of terms that we have around the situation of vaccines, the new ministers, and what we are believing right now is that we don't have enough ICU beds, we don't have enough supplies, oxygen, drugs, and everything that is quite inevitable for treating better our patients. So it's not about seeing um, a point of political exploitation, but on the other side, it's living and daily leaving this, the political determinants of health and how bad they are doing with this whole pandemic system. Right. Gustavo Ribeiro, Brazil, as I said earlier on, is getting its fourth health minister in just a year. I mean, how does one explain this high turnover and how is the government responding to what is an escalating crisis in the country? Thanks for having me. And just before I answer your question, just want to add something to what Dr. Hedges just said, mm -hmm. because it's, I think it's very important. Uh, the, our ambassador said that uh, Brazil doesn't even crack into the top 20 in terms of deaths per million. Mm -hmm. But maybe he failed to mention that uh, Brazil is the 121st uh, nation in terms of tests per million. So. Uh, Almost all our, our experts agree that uh, the real number of deaths, the real number of cases in Brazil are much, much higher than what we know. We only know a tiny portion because we simply don't test enough. When it comes to, and that has a lot to do with the health ministry. And like you said, we are in our, our uh, fourth health minister in one year. Uh, no other country in Latin America that has not uh, uh, experienced a change of government, a democratic ru uh, rupture in terms of uh, the political system, has had as many changes. And that's mainly because President Jair Bolsonaro wants someone who will uh, simply follow his orders and uh, abide by his rules in terms of health policy making. Our president is a defender of hydroxychloroquine, which has no mm -hmm. proven if efficacy against the uh, COVID-19. He is against social isolation. Uh, the ambassador said that uh, this is a matter for states and municipalities. Yes, but the government has abstained itself from doing any sort of effort for a nationwide strategy. It has simply uh, re refrained from taking any action whatsoever. And the president 
blames almost on a daily or weekly basis uh, the governors for the economic crisis. So in terms of when we talk about politicization, we talk about the actions of the Brazilian government. Uh, and now, uh, like Paulo said earlier, uh, the new minister promises continuity and his promises continuity to a health policy that has been scorned, has been frowned upon by the entire scientific community in Brazil and abroad. And the thing is, um, the political establishment in Brazil, as the crisis gets worse, was pressuring Bolsonaro behind the scene mm. to, to change the health minister. The problem is he did not choose a name that is uh, widely uh, uh, supported by the political establishment. As one congressional leader told the Brazilian report uh, yesterday, he has picked a, a man on his own and he will bear the consequences of that choice, which is a pretty on the nose message that if his pick for health minister flops, uh, Brazil will be, it will be much easier for Congress to look for a new president rather than a new health minister. So, Gustavo, is it fair to say then that President Bolsonaro is still having a pretty strong influence on how the government deals with this pandemic? Well, Jair Bolsonaro said something last year that is quite telling. He said, I am the state. So uh, he demands from his cabinet members uh, total alignment to his beliefs, and yes, he is uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the center of how the government acts. And uh, when the ambassador said that Brazil is picking up in its vaccination efforts, we have to mention that uh, the Brazilian government has never acted without being extremely pressured politically. Right. And when Lula comes and defends vaccines, it forces Bolsonaro to do so. Paulo Cabral, uh, you were telling us a moment ago that some states in Brazil have taken very stringent measures to curb the spread of the pandemic. But if we look at the state of Sao Paulo, um, for instance, people there have taken to the streets to protest the lockdown, to protest these restrictions. What can you tell us about, I guess, what's being called lockdown fatigue right now in Brazil? Well, look, we have to look at this also from a, a political point of view, from the kinds of disputes that we see happening here in, in Brazil. So there are hardcore supporters of President Bolsonaro, of this right wing that came to power in Brazil, and they do go to the streets, do take to the streets to support Bolsonaro uh, widely, you know, and, and, and this uh, opposition that Bolsonaro makes to social distancing is also reflected in the positions of these people uh, that take to the streets. But of course, it's not only people protesting, even though... Uh, uh, it's not political, but also we have many people in the streets that do not really support Bolsonaro, uh, not in this protest, but also do not follow uh, social distancing guidelines because of this fatigue that you were talking about. Of course, you know, we have more than one year of the pandemic now going in Brazil and all over the world. Uh, people do have to work also. Some people uh, cannot stay at home because they do have to bring something back home. You know, we had the emergency grants being paid in Brazil until December, then it went away. Now, probably it will come back, but uh, about one-fourth of what was being paid before. So we have uh, this different situation. Supporters of President Bolsonaro take to the streets to protest, actually, against social distancing. Mm -hmm. People that have to take to the streets to work because they do not have money or how to feed their families. And also, of course, people that are not really minding much about this, just have the fatigue and also going to parties, to illegal casinos. For example, we had yesterday the police here in Sao Paulo get into an illegal casino with about 200 people in there. So, yes, there is fatigue and there is also politics playing a part. Paulo Hedges, we were talking uh, earlier on with the Brazilian ambassador and he told us about the vaccination rollout in the country. To what extent is uh, demand outstripping supply in the country? So just this weekend was released one new study from my foundation, from Fio Cruz, that shows that for vaccinating all the population in Brazil, at the speed that we have right now, we would take around three years to get the, to the, all Brazilians to get and receive their doses. So this is unacceptable. We cannot follow on having this such a slow speed of vaccines because we are we are seeing the rate of cases and the gravity, the severity of the cases are going up in a number that we cannot um, cope with the mechanisms that we have right now in hospitals, in primary care. 
So vaccines, as we know, they are right now one of the best measures that we have to contain this pandemic. And the point that we need to improve is that we have the healthcare system, we have SUS in the whole country, and we just need to foster the investments that we have around, because the system is already built, not by this government, but through the past almost 40 years. And what we need to increase now is the capacity that we have of, of our workers to um, to vaccine the population and to have better politics for this. Because when um, when we do have this kind of system of municipalities and governance all really, uh, running the, the vaccine system, but because this is the way the system is structured, but we need a better coordination between municipalities and between governments to assure yeah. that the whole Brazil the whole country can be vaccinated. Okay, Paulo Cabral, uh, very briefly, we know that China is now supplying Brazil with vaccines. Not only that, China has agreed to give Brazil the chemical formula for these vaccines as well as the ingredients to manufacture them in, in the country. Uh, what can you tell us about that? Well, that's right. Actually, right now, about three quarters of the vaccines that have been used in Brazil are the coronavac from China, and they are coming in larger numbers because the governor of Sao Paulo, João Dória Jr., closed the deal with uh, Sinovac Biotech, the Chinese firm that makes the coronavac, back in September to guarantee the supply, something that the federal government did not do with other laboratories. So that's why uh, one of the main reasons why we have mostly the Chinese vaccine in Brazil, and Governor João Dória Jr., of course, also ripping right. political benefit from uh, um, closing this deal with China, but at the same time bringing yeah. the vaccine here to the country. Okay, Gustavo Ribeiro, there is a political element to all of this. We've noticed that President Bolsonaro has actually changed his tone on uh, the coronavirus pandemic. He says he's now willing to accept the vaccine. I'm wondering why the change. Does it have anything to do with the fact that a court in Brazil uh, just a few days ago threw out the conviction of the former president, Lula da Silva? It has everything to do with it, because Lula, uh, he was out of the political game, and when he regains his political rights, he delivers this speech defending vaccination, defending the use of face masks, and defend so, so, defending social isolation. And he's regarded by people from both the left and the right as uh, a statesman-like delivery. Uh, hours later, Bolsonaro appears wearing a mask, which is a rarity for him, and then he signs off a bill that uh, makes vaccination, vaccine purchases easier for uh, local, ad for state administrations. So it is a reaction, a direct reaction to the fact that now, for the first time in two years and a half, he has a worthy opponent on the right. political ring, and that uh, he has to step up to the plate. Okay, we have to leave it there. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.